Welcome, my friends, to the Sage of Prey Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, my very special guest and friend is Walt Schnabel. Walt recently had the opportunity to speak with Denny Lane, where he asked Denny about his days with Beetle Bill. Denny's response to Walt was very interesting and, dare we say, revealing. And so, without further ado, here's the conversation with Walt. Well, folks, we have a very interesting show. My friend uh, Walt Schnabel contacted me a couple of days ago. And as many of you know that follow my work, that I am heavily into the uh, McCartney conspiracy. And Walt had the opportunity to speak with Denny Lane. And uh, Walt, I'm not sure how you had that opportunity or what the circumstances were. So I'm going to be uh, very interested in hearing how that developed. And uh, I also want to say thank you so much for, for contacting me to talk about this Walt interviewed me actually last year, and uh, as I mentioned to you, Walt, in one of the comments on Facebook, that show still gets uh, a lot of views, and uh, I get a lot of feedback because uh, as far as I was concerned, it was one of the better shows that I've done where I was the guest talking about the, the McCartney conspiracy. So uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, well, it's great to hear. I'm glad that people are still uh, listening to it and it's still kind of resonating with people. Still resonating it's, with them. It's good to know. Good to know. So, Walt... What was the conversation with Denny Lane? And maybe we should start with how did you actually get the opportunity to speak to him? Well, it was interesting. I um, I volunteer at a, a music venue. And uh, the way it works is that the guy that is in charge of the volunteers sends out a list of the shows, the upcoming shows for the next month. And you put in for it and you either, you know, either get picked or you don't, depending usually on how quickly you put in for it. So I saw Denny Lane. And and the uh, the Moody Wings Band, which is kind of a play on you know his his past history, right. which which we can get to in a little bit. Um, so I put in for it, and I get an email back back from the guy saying that I got the show. You know, so great. So um, so in the interim, uh, you posted your I guess that's your most recent expo on on the on the Paul's Dead thing. Uh, it was done in December. Yeah, the one where I it was the uh, the Beatles, McCartney, and the Grand Illusion, the PowerPoint yes, presentation. Yes. That one. That's the one. Yeah. Right. So um, I watched it, and it was great. I mean, I you know, for my money, it's the definitive piece of work on that on that topic up up to this point, anyway. Um, and and the reason why I say that is it's really about more than the Paul's Dead thing. It's really more about how um, our our illusions are being created by some group of people perhaps that want us to, to not know the truth or, or want the truth to be masked in a series of, I call them delusions, really. So that's why I felt that that was a, a very, very serious and well thought out piece of work. And, and a lot of stuff you see on YouTube and stuff is OK, but it's it's not really well, well thought out or, or even well researched. And, and you did all of that. So so to me, it was and I, I posted that um, on my Facebook page and I, I did get some reactions from people on it. Um, very positive ones. Well, thank you, Will. You deserve it, Mike. You put a lot of work into that. So I got to thinking that, you know, here I, I, I'm going to see Danny Lane and, and you in your uh, PowerPoint presentation, you brought out a, a, a video of him being interviewed. Um, I don't know how far back that was, maybe. A few years ago, anyway. It was about a year or two, yeah. Yeah. Um, and we had talked about that in our previous conversation when, when we interviewed you. And he was being interviewed by a guy from a rock uh, venue of some kind of rock magazine. or And they were drinking pretty heavily. And <laughs> so, you know, sometimes people tend to say things when they're drinking that they may not necessarily say otherwise. So at the very end of the interview, he kind of <clears throat> brought in the whole idea of Billy Shears and to Denny. And, and Denny kind of laughed a little bit and hesitated and but then he but he he really did kind of come clean on it too and he admitted that you know there was something to the whole billy shears you know i don't know if you want to elaborate on that a little bit more but well what he did in that interview was um and this is what i point out in the presentation walt is that he never mentions the name paul mccartney so when he's asked about what it was like to play with billy shepherd he never says what, what do you mean 
Billy Shepard. He says, Billy Shears. Mm -hmm. He never says, what are you talking about? I played with Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney is the guy that I yeah. played with yeah. in Wings, right? So he never, ever says that. And this is something that goes over a lot of people's heads because the way this works is they know that people will fill in the blanks. They know that people will assume that it's just Paul McCartney. And this is why I spent a lot of time over the last few months uh, getting people educated on what the Masons refer to as masterfully speaking. Right. When they masterfully speak, they can disclose an enormous amount of truth, but they have to do it in a disguised way. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Denny was doing. Even though he had, you know, a number of drinks under his belt, he still kept the masterfully speaking technique under control. And at the very end of that interview, it was, it was very interesting. He says, well, who the hell is Billy Campbell anyway? Mm -hmm. Right. So there was a lot of things going on there. But Absolutely. the most important piece of that dialogue is he never says, I played with Paul McCartney. He never mentions McCartney's name. And that's what everybody needs to take in when they watch that clip. So given that, you know, that piece in, in your expo, um, I got to thinking, well, you know, sometimes when, the, you know, when you're a volunteer, you have to get there early to set the, you know, set up and, and make sure everything's the way it should be and go over the, the lists and all that stuff. So generally I get there about oh, an hour and a half before the show. And most times the, the group is doing a sound check at that point. Now, on Tuesday night when the when the show was, I, I got there a little late because um, uh, we had an ice storm. So I didn't uh, – the sound check was already done. And that's generally one of the times when, as a volunteer, you can sometimes interact with the musicians. So I kind of blew that part of it. I was thinking maybe he would – sometimes they'll walk around after they do the sound check and just chat with people, you know. So I thought that might have been one of the opportunities where I could get to kind of interact with him a little bit. So anyway, I missed out on that. So I'm thinking, well, you know, I don't know how this is going to work out. So um, he comes out and, and does the show. And, he, and he, you know, he at this point, he looks kind of like a little – like your old uncle Joe from Thanksgiving. You know, he's got dyed hair and, and he's – He's, uh, he, he doesn't present very well anymore. You know, at, at some yeah. point he was, you know, he was, he was a rock star, you right. know, pretty much. Um, so, but, but, you know, when he gets up on the stage and picks his guitar up, there's like a magic happens. He, he's just an incredible performer. I mean, you know, he's still got a, a pretty good voice, um, maybe not quite as good as, you know, when he was in his twenties, but he can still sing a song, you know, and, and he did a lot of his material. He did, uh, and a couple of things I didn't even realize. He he did the the song Go Now. Yeah. Now backtracking a little bit to his his past in the in the English music scene. Um, he 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 he's got a boatload of credentials. I mean, under his belt, and and I'm sure you know all this, but um, you know he was the original founder of the Moody Blues. I think he was with them for for a couple of their albums. And on stage, he said, you know, I, I was in the Moody Blues. I started the Moody Blues. And, but I wasn't there for the Knights in White Satin stage. <laughs> he says, I could sing that if I wanted to, but I, but I don't want to. So, but it, so he's, he's a really jovial kind of, he's got a very polished stage presence, you know, and he, he, he just had the audience in the palm of his hand. And, and he's still a really good guitar player. I mean, I, I don't know if you, I mean, you're a guitar player, so, so you can probably judge his playing a little more critically. But Denny's very talented. Yeah, he is. He really is. And I didn't know this. I, I really only knew him. In terms of the fact that he played with Wings, I didn't know too much about his past, you know, musicology, I guess. And and truthfully, I, I was never a huge fan of Wings. I, I, I don't know why. I just they just never really did it for me. I, I I thought they were very poppy, and but and a lot of people loved them, and you know, more power to them. So, but Denny had a big role in that band. He was you know, he was one of the main players. So he went through his whole kind of progression of. Music and and I another thing I didn't realize that he's he was very blues based. Um, he he talked about um, meeting Sonny Boy Williamson, an, an old blues player in Paris, and he taught him how to play the harmonica on different songs. And it was he he really did a, a very retrospective of his career, you know, on stage, and it was great. It was a it was a really a wonderful show, and the people loved it, you know. I mean, they, he just had everybody in the palm of his hand. So the show's over and he played about two hours, which is, you know, with no break, which is, you know, pretty good for, uh, he's like 75 now around in that area. So yep. 
you know, he's he's probably um, that's you know it's probably a lot of energy for him to put out to do a two hour show, and a lot of you know a lot of energy put out, not just going through the motions kind of thing. He he really did did a lot. So the show's over, and um, he's still pretty popular. So there was maybe ten or twelve people kind of hanging around, sort of waiting to see if he was going to come out because it's it's very small small venue and after the show a lot of times like the drummer came out and got a beer and the bass player came out and people were talking to him and so the manager of the, of the place was talking to some of the people that were waiting there and he says he had talked to Denny backstage and he's he's not coming out he's just too tired and he doesn't you know he doesn't want to sign autographs and so I thought oh well that's kind of you know that's kind of shitty but you know, it's the way it is. He's a he's he's a, he's a big star. You know, and he's seventy five years old. And he's seventy five, <laughs> right? So you know, so I can understand. Yeah. I can understand. So um, I'm starting to think now that my eyes is not looking too good. You know, I may not get to to interact with him. Um, so I was a little disappointed. But it, but one thing about being a volunteer is you can kind of hang out after everybody leaves, and you know, you have to kind of get the chair straightened out and pick cans of bottles up and that, you know, kind of get the place ready for the next show. So I was hanging out with another lady who was, who was a volunteer and uh, she's a big wings fan and she was kind of hoping to get a glimpse of Denny, you know, and this kind of thing. So we were talking about shows she had seen and stuff like that. And now pretty much all the people who were hanging around waiting to see him have, you know, faded away, faded off. There's only a few people left. So he kind of comes ambling out of the, um, out of the dressing room and he's, putting his guitar, you know, messing with his guitars and his equipment and stuff. So I said, uh, I said, hey, Danny, great show, you know. And I was maybe, I don't know, 20 feet away from him. The two of us were standing there. And so he came walking over, you know. And he said, oh, that's nice to hear. And, and he's really a very affable guy, you know. I mean, it kind of came across on the um, on the video clip that you had when he was being interviewed. Yeah. He, you know, I, granted, he was he had a few drinks, but, but he was very friendly. He was very... Very affable, and he's like, "Oh, I'm glad you like the show." And I said, I, "I understand this is the the first night of your tour." And uh, he said, "Yeah, yeah." He said, "I played with these guys, and he had some young younger guys playing with him, you know, but they're all really good musicians." And he had a tight band for you know being the the first stop on the tour, and and he said, "Oh, well, glad to hear that," you know. And he was he was really very very uh, approachable and friendly, and so the the conversation, and she started talking about seeing him. In the '78 tour, Wings Across America, and, and he, you know, he liked hearing all that stuff. So the conversation was kind of winding down, and so I said, uh, "So I said, Danny, um, have you seen Bill the Beetle lately?" And he he stopped, <laughs> kind of stopped, his <laughs> like he was kind of stunned. And he said, he looked at me kind of crosswise, and he said, "Well, what are you talking about?" You know, in that, that heavy English accent, "What are you talking about?" And I said, "You know, Bill the Beetle." And he said, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but you could kind of tell that he did. You know, he's kind of like he had that affect like, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I'm not going to go there kind of thing. Yeah. You know how people do. You know, so he looked at the lady standing next to me. He said, what's he talking about? I don't know what he's talking about. And he, and he was kind of joking like, you know what I mean? And I wanted to keep it sort of light. I didn't, I didn't want to accost him with this. You know what I mean? I wanted to. To keep it sort of like we were joking about it, you know, and, and he was okay with that. So I said, "Come on, come on, Danny, you know what I'm talking about. You you know who Bill the Beetle is." And he said, "No, no, no." He said, "Oh, oh." He said, "Is is that the?" And this, I, I I missed the name that he said. I wish I had heard it more clearly. He said, "Are you you're talking about the tall, left-handed bass player named Bill somebody?" <laughs> it was, and it, it wasn't Shep. It wasn't Shepard or Shears or anything. it was some name. I. And, I'm quite sure that's who he was talking about. I yeah. mean, think about it. Bill Shepard's taller than, yes. the, than the original Paul. Left-handed bass player. And he kind of laughed. You know, he, it was still on a kind of a lighthearted mode, you know. And he said, well, he said, I don't know what you're talking about, mate. You know, and, and he, and he kind of started walking away, you know. And he was kind of fumbling with his stuff again. And so I said, come on, Danny, you know, you know what I'm talking about, Bill Shepard, Billy Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked up. <laughs> it was it was a very almost surreal moment, you know, because I could see he was he was thinking and he was probably trying to figure out what to say or how to say it. And, you know, when you think about it, this is Denny Lake. You know, he didn't have to even answer me. He didn't have to say I mean, he could have just said, you know, forget you. Cause I'm no, you know, I'm just a volunteer at the place, you know. So he looks up and he says, oh, you mean Bill McCartney? 
He said, no, I haven't seen him for quite a while. There you go. There you go. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, because, <laughs> you, you know, you're the you're the master of this. But, um, you know, I think that was masterful talk yes. that he was doing, you know, and, and what's what's so what's your spin on that? Well, I, I think you caught him a little off guard, which was good. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. So what happened was, you know, he wasn't able to play through his mind in advance how he was going to address yeah. any questions that would come up that way because he wasn't expecting that question to come up. And so when you presented it and then you pushed it a little bit, you know, Denny had to go into, okay, how do I respond to this? But again, Walt, as you're telling this story, he never says Paul McCartney. Absolutely not. Absolutely right? not. So this is the thing. He doesn't mention him mm -mm. because he never played with biological Paul McCartney. He's only played with Bill. Mm -hmm. And he played with Bill back in the days of the diplomats. Right. Then, you know, his Wings career. So that was, uh, in my view, another example of uh, masterfully speaking. He probably stumbled a little bit with it because he was caught off guard. But again, not to sound like a broken record, but the takeaway here is that uh, Denny never says, what are you talking about? All this Beetle Bill nonsense and uh, Billy Shepard and Billy Campbell or Billy Shears. I mean, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I played with Paul McCarty. I, you guys just need to stop with this. Never said that. Right. That would be the natural response from somebody if they were asked questions about something that was just crazy. They would just say, just stop it. Shut it down. Stop asking me these questions. This stuff is all nonsense that is never said. That's kind of the approach he took when the, when I first said it. He he looked at me like, well, what are you talking about? You know. Yeah. But I think he he knew exactly what I was. Now, Bill the Beetle is, from what I understand, is is what George Harrison and I, I think maybe Lennon referred to to Bill Shepard. Yeah. They, that's how they referred to him. There's a there's a clip of a dinner party at which I think was at I think at John's house. And, and George was sitting there and he said, oh, when when's Bill the Beetle coming? Or, and and Len repeated it or something. And, and, and um, so that must be how they're there. That was their little sort of joke between them, I guess, maybe. Yeah, that was his uh, that that's what they called him, Beetle Bill. And in that clip, there's a, a truer version of that clip. They actually mentioned Beetle Bill and Beetle Ed. Yeah. What was what's Beetle? What was Beetle Ed? Nobody knows. I mean, I, I don't. I'm gonna say nobody knows. Obviously, somebody knows. I don't know who Beetle Ed is. Oh, okay. Uh, so you don't. You don't even you know. That. I don't know who that is. Uh, I have uh, hypothesized that perhaps in my last uh, presentation, um, the Beatles, Paul McCartney, and the Grand Illusion, that maybe Beetle Ed could be a reference to Street Paul. Maybe. Apparently, were more than one Pauls or fake. Yeah, they, they were. I presented a theory that they were two permanent replacements. That doesn't mean that others did not play the role over time. The premise is, is that my premise, two permanent replacements. One was an actor who was not a musician. That would be the public persona. Mm -hmm. And then there was Bill, Billy Shepard, whose surgeries lagged behind that of Street Paul. But it didn't matter because Billy's role was to write and record music, right? So he would be within the confines of a recording studio, right, right. within the company of those people that knew the story. So, you know, no big deal. Mm -hmm. And while he was recording and writing songs as a Beatle, we had Street Paul playing the, the part, acting on the outside for public consumption. Right. And I don't know if you know much about this, but apparently Denny was being considered for the role of, of the replacement. The replacement for Paul. Did, had you ever heard that? And, and that, may, that may be conjecture. I don't know. But, or if there's any truth at all, I don't know. There are uh, theories out there that he actually was one of the others that played the role here and there. In other words, he would page in and page out. So mm. it wasn't a permanent engagement. Like a substitute kind of. Yeah, yeah he would substitute in. It's like uh, there's a theory out there that Spencer Davis did the same thing. That, uh -huh. uh, that some of the Pauls that we see over time are actually Spencer Davis done up to look like Paul with makeup and all that stuff. Uh, and, th and that's why it became very difficult for uh, Paul is Dead researchers to take a look at photographs or images on the Internet and to discern who is who. Right. Because there's a lot of different permutations of it. Yeah. My theory of a street Paul and a musician Paul, well, right there we have 
two versions. They, they are not exact replicas. They have resemblances to biological Paul, but, you know, mm -hmm. there are differences. So you had those two out there, plus you had other actors filling in and paging in and out. Perhaps it was Denny, perhaps it was Spencer Davis. And, you know, they're being photographed and, uh, and images are being altered. And, you know, back in the day, I, you know, I don't think we had Photoshop back in the 60s and 70s. No, no. Uh, but there were ways that the controllers uh, had ways of, uh, of doctoring photos. And so they were doing a, do a lot of doctoring and altering. And by the time we got to the Internet, as we know it, in 1990, the, the people behind the conspiracy, uh, Tavistock and company, they had 25 to 30 years of contaminating the waters, you know? And yeah. so by the time we all caught up with uh, taking a look at different photos and images on the Internet and trying to figure out which side is up, it became a very, very difficult process to do that. Yeah. And that was intentionally done. That was intentionally done in order to create the confusion. Oddly enough, though, having seen him close up, and I said he looks, you know, he looks, he's an old man now, but he does kind of resemble Paul a little bit um, facially. I mean, the, you know, the replacement Paul, not the, not yeah. the biological Paul, the Bill. And, and if you look at the current photos of, of, what people think is Paul McCartney, he, he does sort of resemble the face structure. And even when they were younger, yeah. if you look at the, the pictures way back, um, they, they do kind of resemble each other. So I, so I can kind of see that. But, but, but the thing I really wanted to, to remark about is, is that during the period of time where he was kind of contemplating what to say, um, I got, and this is just my, interpretation or my intuition intuitive view maybe uh he he did look like he was he wanted to say something he didn't want to just blow me off and just say you know hit the road or whatever um so so i wondered is is there something that that he feels like he he's trying to get this off his chest is there a you know, is there um, sort of a guilt factor or, you know, that he's been part of this? And he really has been kind of a – well, I mean, he's got to have known this this whole illusion since almost the beginning. I mean, he – I think he knew – I think he actually knew biological Paul at some point because they – you know, in the early 60s, those guys kind of all knew each other. Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> before the Beatles were – the Beatles, they, they played together and hung out and, you know, he's – He's gone on tape and said that they had big parties at some mansion and the Beatles, you know, Harrison would come and McCartney would come. And, and right. so so he, he has to have known about this whole thing right right on down the line. And and then he got picked to be in wings um, because I think he had a connection to, to Bill. He had a connection to Bill going back to the diplomats. So right, uh, right. there was a character in the diplomats called Phil Ackrell. Well, I want to ask you about that, where that comes in. What's the story behind that? Okay, so in the memoirs of Billy Shears, Bill, who's clearly behind the book, and I can get into that a little bit too because sometimes uh, we've got people out there saying it's complete disinformation and it's fiction, but it's not. Right. Uh, but in the book, he says that you know he, he has played uh, various characters over time, one of them being Phil Ackrell in The Diplomats. When he was playing the role of Phil Ackrell in The Diplomats, Denny Lane was in the band. So it was Phil Ackrell and Denny Lane. Uh, they actually recorded a, a complete album, which is uh, locked away in memoirs. Bill says that perhaps someday they will release the album. But, you know, that album has basically been put on a shelf for obvious reasons, right? Because then you're going to start to make voice comparisons and all that stuff. And we're going to start to close in on validating that Bill is playing the part of Paul McCartney. But in any case, so uh, so what Bill did you know, he had Denny in the band, or Denny had him in the band back during the days of the Diplomats. This is like early 60s. Early 60s, 1960s, 61, 62, very early 1960s. They were very young guys. I mean, Bill at that time was 23 years old in 1960, so they were just, you know, young young guys. And uh, so when uh, Billy formed Wings, all he did was he just, you know, tapped his old friend Denny Lane to come back and, and help him fire up. This band, that's that's what Bill did, right? So Bill reached back into his past. Denny's always been a good friend of his yeah. and said, hey, look, you know, the Beatle thing is over. Uh, I want to form a new band. I'm starting from scratch. Will you join me? And so Denny said, yeah, sure. You know, let's do it. Let's just like the old days. Let's do it again, you know? Mm -hmm. 
But I do want to explain the actual thing because uh, there are folks that are listening to this right now that will be screaming and yelling at the uh, at the monitor into the speakers <laughs> saying that, no, you know, Phil Ackrell, we have a video of Phil Ackrell in the 1980s and the 1990s and, that, you know, he, Billy Shepard didn't play Phil Ackrell. This is all nonsense. What what folks have to understand is this is the model, the template that they use. They had various people page in and step in and play the roles over time. So the, the character of Phil Ackrell with the diplomats was Bill Shepard. When Billy had to leave because he was doing other work, then what would happen is they would bring in somebody else that would play the role of Phil Ackrell. And this person would have a similar look, like a, maybe a double, a lookalike, and, and, and stuff like that. And honestly, the diplomats were not big enough for anybody to really notice if somebody got swapped out. That's the other thing that everybody has to remember, right? Mm -hmm. We only know, really know about the diplomats today, those of us that are following the Paul is Dead conspiracy, because you know we've tied the diplomats in to the McCartney conspiracy because we're saying that Shepard played the, the part of Ackrell in the band, right. right? And has ties to Denny Lane. Uh, so when people show me videos of uh, Phil Ackrell, allegedly Phil Ackrell playing in a band, uh, you know, small venues, very small venues in the 1980s or the 1990s, what they're seeing is they're seeing a, another actor slash musician playing that role, playing that part. That's what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's the same thing as, uh, well, similar to the whole premise I brought forth, the theory of street Paul versus musician Paul, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we find in the updated version of uh, the memoirs of Billy Shears, Walt, that the blue cover, the old version was the red cover. Mm -hmm. You notice we have red and blue. I mean, yeah, we talked about that in the previous show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Red Lodge, Blue Lodge. Yeah, it all has meaning. It's all symbolic. It all it's all symbolic and it's it's all tied out. Uh nothing is by chance. Everything is thought out. It, it's all been strategized and put into play. But then when we read the the new version of the memoirs of Billy Shears, a lot of people argue with me that uh, Billy did not play Vivian Stanshall. Because if you look at videos of Vivian Stanshall on YouTube when he's not with the Bonzo Dog Band, uh they say, well, you know, that doesn't look like him at all. Well, uh, I think it's page 84 of the uh, the revised version of Memoirs. Uh, Bill explains in a footnote. Actually, Tom does the footnote, but of course, all this information is coming from Bill. Uh, right. You know, Bill has to sanction what goes into the book. Uh, it says that there was a a lifetime actor playing Stanshall for the purposes of public consumption, and there was the Vivian Stanshall that was performing with the Bonzo Dog Band with Neil Innocent Company. That version with the Bonzo Dog Band was Bill Shepard. The other version that people are looking at that made uh, TV appearances or doing some acting and, and dabbling, he was a musician also, but he would dabble with his instrument a little bit and so on. And if you look at the two Stanshalls, if you take a look at the Vivian Stanshall that was in the Bonzo Dog Band with Neil Innes, and then you take a look at the Stanshall that was, you know, the, kind of the quirky uh, character in, in some of these other videos. Yeah, he was kind of weird looking. He had big glasses and, and kind of long, kind of freakish looking hair. and Almost like he had a wig on or something. It was it's very strange looking. Very, a lot of latex was used and stuff like that. What you're looking at is if you try, if you compare the Stanshall in the Bonzo Dog Band and then you compare the other Stanshall, you should take a step back. They are not the same person. They are not the same person. And the reason why they're not the same person is because Billy put in place a lifetime actor to play the part of Vivian Stanshall. This person took on the Stanshall character, which Bill created, and this person lived their life that way. This is the same person, that version of Stanshall, the street version, who married Kai Longfellow and had children. And this is the one that died in the fire back in 1995 at the age of 51. But he's not Vivian Stanshall. Vivian Stanshall is fiction. He's a, he's a character. So we don't know the name of the, the lifetime actor, or at least I don't know the, the name of that person, but he played that role. And what happened was, uh, Bill wanted to retire the, uh, the role altogether. I guess they were going to have a fictitious death and all this stuff. And according to memoirs, 
he was uh, going to have this this actor, this lifetime actor, taken care of for the rest of his life. In other words, you know, he received some kind of payment or pension, whatever it may be, to uh, just to retire the character. And Hush money. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess hush money. But what happened was, according to the book, this actor said, no, no way. I'm not going to do this because... I have made a career out of this. This is this is who I am today. I'm playing this character, Vivian Stanshall. This has become my life. This has become my identity. And he refused to do it. Bill felt, you know, I guess he thought, well, if I give this guy a ton of money, he's just going to make a very simple decision and say, right. I'm not going to do this anymore. But the guy pushed back. And then what happened was he died in a fire. You know, I don't want to read into that. Very really. Ryan fires. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know? I know. I know. <laughs> right? Of, of maybe a mysterious origin. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. Stan Shaw that was married, had two children, and died. So it's all kind of muddled up. That's that's kind of uh, by intention. It seems like it's by intention. The template is the same, though, uh, Walt, right? So the template they're using is, is that they have actors and people playing roles, paging in and out. Some of them are lifetime actors, like the, in the case of... Uh, this, the person that was playing Vivian Stanshaw for public consumption. Other times, they are actors just playing a role for a particular moment in time. So uh, in, in the new memoirs, he even says that uh, there was a, uh, a, a version of uh, Paul, a person playing the role, but also who was a musician who did some recording. It's a little ambiguous, but I'm reading between the lines, and I think what Bill is telling us is that on a Beatle album, so maybe there's a couple of songs that the Beatles did where the version of Paul McCartney was not Bill Shepard. It was another person playing the role of Paul McCartney, at least in the studio, right, mm -hmm. that was recorded and wound up as an album track on a Beatle album. This whole McCartney thing, right, it's, it's more than just uh, a musician that, was swapped out. It's it's far more than that. It's much. It goes much deeper. And it's much, much much deeper. Much than this. much more. It speaks much more toward how our reality is being manipulated. I think this is this is a piece of that whole picture. I think exactly. you know, and that's the real the real important takeaway from the whole thing. I think is that what's like like John said, nothing is real. <laughs> right, living <laughs> is easy. Strawberry with fields clothes. forever. Yeah. Uh, so getting back to. Yeah. To, to Denny's reaction, that, that you know, when I talked to him, um, I, I really did have the feeling that it was it was and, and this is probably reading into it quite a bit, but that it was almost confessional in some sense, like um, like he felt like he had to say something like it was it was sort of obligatory. And, and maybe that's part of the whole um, Masonic piece, the whole, you know, that you, you can't just not say something. So you say something that kind of creates an ambiguous sort of response. And and that's what it's why do you think he chose Bill McCartney? That that's that's an interesting choice, I think. Because he he was he was answering, but he wasn't answering. You know what I mean? In some sense. Yeah, he was saying that because uh he's he's giving you the clue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who, he's he's telling well we know there is no Bill McCartney. Who the heck is Bill McCartney? It's yeah. Paul McCartney. Yeah. yeah. So by inserting the name Bill as the first name and then saying McCartney, what he's telling you and what he's telling us is that the guy that I played with was not biological Paul McCartney. Right. That's the way I got. Without a question of a doubt. And to answer your question, Walt, because it's a good question, you, you know, he seems like he wants to get something out. Well, Billy wants to get it out also. Otherwise, the right. memoirs of Billy Shears would never have been mm -hmm. published, right? And the reason why... Billy wants to disclose is because for over 50 years, nobody knows who Bill is. Everybody thinks that the guy that's written all these songs from Sgt. Pepper on all through his solo career is uh, Paul McCartney. No, it's not Paul McCartney. It's Billy Shepard. It's Billy Shears. If you you know if you want to argue the last name, Billy Campbell. What I don't care about the last name, by the way. Yeah, it's it's all the same person. It's all the same person, right? So we have these aliases or whatever. It doesn't really matter. So Billy's at a point now where his runway is getting short. He's 81 years old. So I, I guess as part of his agreement, whatever agreement he reached is allowing him to be able to go through the disclosure process now. And so he's doing that. And unfortunately for people like Denny, 
who have had to sit on this thing for a very long time. Because Denny's in the club too, right? Oh yeah, uh, there's there's, um, there's a picture I ran. Not to interrupt you, but there's a picture I ran across of replacement Paul and Linda. This is probably from the Wings days, and Danny on. They were just doing a publicity photo, and Danny was doing the Illuminati, the horns, the you know the yeah. Illuminati sign, and she was too. Yeah, uh, she was doing the V, the V sign, and McCartney was doing something else too. But they were all doing sort of an Illuminati sign, so you know that he's he's part of the whole the whole thing. Yeah, he's in the club. But the problem that Denny has now, and for others who are associated with Bill, is that more and more people are understanding this conspiracy and their understanding that there was a deception involved and more and more people, or let's just say this, the odds are increasing that any time that Denny runs into people or opens up the possibility of having a discussion with him, that they're going to ask him this question. So there's more and more pressure put on the likes of Denny Lane and others who have participated in the conspiracy to have to figure out more ingenious ways to be able to respond to questions like the question you asked. And he says, well, you know, Bill McCartney, right? So, and this is be all being driven by the fact that Bill himself has decided he's going to disclose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's a domino effect, right? So Bill, being the main guy, has decided I'm going to disclose. The time is now. And so everybody else who's attached to him has now got the uh, the additional or the added pressure of having to be in step with him as to how much they can disclose, mm -hmm. how much they can say. In the past, most people blew the conspiracy off. They just said, oh, it's a bunch of bullshit, right? You know, this is just ridiculous. And so they were able to leverage that angle of it. But as more and more people now are realizing that this conspiracy is real, it's putting them on the spot. It's putting Denny Lane on the spot. And, and like I said, you caught him off guard because here he is. He's putting his guitars away, and you know he's getting himself all you know packed up. It wasn't it wasn't a, an interview per se. It wasn't an interview, right? It wasn't like a setup interview. That and he does a lot of those, I know. But uh, so I so I I did kind of yeah I did surprise him. But the you know the weird thing is uh, you know I I kind of half expected him to be angry and say uh, you know just get away from me or so, you know and i had right. told i had told you that i was joking about that he he might have me thrown out you know like if i had talked to him before the show right um you know and that probably wouldn't happen but um but i i half expected him to say just get away from me you know don't why are you why are you asking me that or something but he didn't and he and he was really almost kind of affable about it you know it, it was like he was joking about it you know and i kept it in that vein too I said at one point, I said, oh, oh, Danny, I'm, you know, I'm just teasing you, you know, just to keep it lighthearted, you know, and he, he kind of smiled and laughed and he, at no point during the whole thing, during the whole interaction, was he angry or, um, surly or anything like that. You know, he was just, yeah, you know, like he was just, yeah, you know, like he was talking to one of his buddies, you know, or something, you know, so I, I, I thought that. A little curious. I just thought that was a little curious, but but um, I do think there's an element of, you know, he's he's carried this around for a long time, you know, right. and you think about that carrying a, some secret around with you, and that's you know that's the first thing you do when you get into into some kind of psychoanalysis is you try to get all the crap off your chest that you've been, you know, all the baggage you've been carrying around with you your whole life, you know, and and and, and maybe that's part of the what he's doing. I don't know. And maybe part of it is that, you know, they're moving toward that. They're moving toward disclosure or, or whatever you want to call it. Or, you know, and maybe he's part of that whole process too. I don't, I don't know. What's your, what's your feeling? I, I just, I, I just got that. I just got a very, it was almost like I said, it was like a surreal moment, you know, where it was, you know, how you have a, sort of like almost like an out of body experience sometimes. And it was like, it was almost like, we connected on another level or something, you know, and he, he kind of felt like he had to say something to me about it. You know, and I, you know, he never, I never met him before and he didn't know who the hell I was. So it was a, yeah, kind of a surreal experience, you know, like an out of body experience sort of thing. Uh, it was, was, it was just very strange, very strange. Well, there's a couple of things going on. Number one is, you know, he's obviously very well aware that the disclosure is underway and it is, it is underway. Uh, the memoirs of Billy Shears is, uh, is Bill telling us, his life story, and, and he's telling us 
in a masterfully disclosed way how this thing happened. And um, Denny knows that disclosure is, is happening. And so he's playing a part in it. He has to participate in it. And Denny just needs to make sure, and he knows this, right? He's, he's a high-level Freemason, that he stays in lockstep with the rate and pace of the disclosure. He can't get ahead of it, is what I'm saying, right? Right. He can't be the one that's going to spill the beans. He's got to stay in lockstep. And the other piece of it is, you're absolutely correct, in my opinion, that this is a heavy load to carry, right? Even though you're sworn to secrecy and all this stuff, and this is the way it works and all that, you still know that there was a a monstrosity of a deception that took place. And you're carrying that with you. And uh, so there is that part of you that says, you know, I, I just want to offload this thing. I want to get this thing off my chest. I don't want to keep carrying this around. The other piece of it is that in my um, last presentation, I was told by a, uh, uh, a high-level Freemason that the way the Freemasons look at the population is that there are two classes of people. There are those people with the key for knowledge, and there are those that do not possess that key, right? Right. So when a Mason is uh, interacting with somebody that they detect possesses that key, they will have a uh, a higher level conversation with that person. Mm -hmm. You possess that key. So when you had the discussion with Denny, Denny had to tailor the conversation with you in a way that he can disclose information to you, give you a little bit more of the pieces to the puzzle than he would have given somebody else. Mm -hmm. right? So as an example, if uh, you had said to him, hey, you know, what was it like to play with Paul McCartney? He would look at that person asking that question as somebody that perhaps does not possess that key. And so they will get a response that is appropriate for somebody that is not knowing. So they notch it down. You're going to get the profane answer is what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you asked him, he knew that you knew. You mm -hmm. see? And uh, so he had to raise the bar on his response to you without openly saying, ah. Yeah. Paul's up, you're right, you're right? <laughs> right. So, but, but, it, but in a way, he did that. And it's funny how Denny's doing this because the interview going back a year or two ago that I have in my presentation, he's clearly telling us there. Anybody who's thinking through this will realize what Denny's telling us. And then this conversation with you. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful part about your conversation with him is he wasn't expecting it. No, it was off the cuff. Yeah, it was definitely off the cuff. It was. You know, the. Another piece of this, and I don't know whether we talked about this in the previous interview we did or not, but my father was a Mason, um, not not a real high-level Mason. But um, one time when I was a kid, maybe, I don't know, 11, 12 years old, something like that, we were sitting in a diner and, you know, just having a hamburger or something. And, and this guy came came along, and my father said to him, and I, I can still remember this distinctly to this day, my father said to him, have you done any traveling lately? You know, which, which is a kind of an odd thing to say. You know, um, <clears throat> so the guy responded in some way and, and I somehow I absorbed that conversation. I, I don't know how or why. But after the guy left, I said to my father, was that some kind of a code or something that you used? And and my father sort of got flustered. My father didn't fluster easily. And he said, well, don't ever say that. To any, you know, don't say that to anybody. That's some, you know, that's a secret thing. And, you know, it had to do with him being a Mason, you know. And yeah. so maybe on some level I absorbed that and that came through um, on some level to Denny when I, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's a little bit of a conjecture, I guess. But who knows? On some, some level he knew that I knew. And he had to respond, you know, um, for whatever the reason was. I don't know. But it was it was, like I said, it was just I mean, I didn't know what he was going to say. I figured he really nine, nine out of ten times. I would think he would just say, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, buddy. You know, it's what a lot of people would do that. You know, so it was just it was it was very interesting. It was it was very, very, um, like I said, very uh, I was very surprised at how he responded, you know. And what's even more interesting about it, Walt, is that, you know, you had this conversation with him. He doesn't, he doesn't know who you are. He doesn't yeah. know who you're connected to. So, Absolutely. so shortly afterwards, uh, you and I are talking about the conversation, right? So this is how, uh, it gets, uh, communicated out to the yes. masses, right? It's so true. a very it's simple true. conversation 
which in many situations would go nowhere other than the two people having the conversation, is now going to be disseminated out to a much broader audience. And, you know, in my view, and you and I, you know, both have uh, very strong spiritual understandings. Yes. To me, this is the universe's way of ensuring that the truth is published, that it's put out there. Like a correction. People, for, <laughs> you know, right. For those who have ears to hear, eyes mm -hmm. to see, you're going to see this, you're going to hear this. To me, that's that's a, a big piece of this, too. I don't, you know, I don't look at that and say, oh, that's kind of weird that he spoke to you, then you spoke to me, and then I have 15,000 subscribers, you know. Right. <laughs> There's yeah, a reason no, why. True. There is. Right? There's Absolutely. a reason why that path was taken. Yeah. But, you know, it's funny, the um, getting back a little bit to, to carrying this burden around, um, I think Harrison and Lennon had the same the same thing that, you know, they were carrying that around with them. And that's why they put all of those clues out there in their songs. And um, and I, I was I went back and listened to to Harrison's acceptance speech at the at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, which Paul didn't show up to. I'm not sure why. Yeah. And but well, anyway, Billy, yeah, uh, well, Billy, yeah, he really didn't show up. Um, <clears throat> so Harrison said during the course of the speech that we're just, you know, it's just kind of a segment of the Beatles here. And, and um, we know why we know why John's not here, uh, obviously, because he'd been killed. And and then he said, we love John and we loved past tense Paul. Right. So to me, that was a you know, that was an indication of, you know, if he had, if he was talking about the current Paul or Bill, he would have said we love Paul. You know, present tense. Right. So to me, little things like that, you know, where they're just kind of releasing this angst that they've been or this guilt or whatever you want to call it. Maybe I don't know whether guilt, maybe guilt's a little too strong a word, but maybe not. I don't know um, that they feel like they've been part of this big lie, you know, and and it's it's it is a burden to carry around. It's like if you were, you know, if you were impersonating somebody, uh, if Mike Williams was impersonating somebody and you had to constantly be on guard of not letting this little thing out that's going to indicate who you are. You know, like if you're, a, you know, I, I don't know if you've committed a crime or something and you, and you have to always be on guard. That's why they, they say it's, it's hard to, it's hard to cover up a lie, you know, it's because yeah. there's all these little things that you have to be aware of, you know, and, and uh, you have to be really good at not divulging things. So maybe that's part of the whole, the whole thing with Danny too. You know, the, it's, 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 it's sort of a release for, for these people, you know, that's, that's a big burden. I think 50 years to, to have to not weigh every word you say kind of pretty much. And, you know, I, I don't know what they say behind the scenes and everything, but, you know. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? So George also said that uh, I'm going to paraphrase here, but he had said it's uh, it's kind of sad that this is what is left. Yes. And he was talking about him and right. Ringo. Mm -hmm. Right. So he was talking yeah. about there are only two Beatles left from the original band. And you're right. He did say, uh, and we all loved, past tense, Paul. Right. And that struck me. Yeah, that was a clip that I had put together, uh, and I had actually slowed down uh, George's audio so that it was very clear that he was using past tense. Because if you run it at normal speed, you're, you're going to miss it. Especially if you're just listening to it as just like a an acceptance speech that doesn't have exactly. any kind of uh, innuendo built into it. Yeah, but when you go back and listen to it a couple of times, it's very clear. Even, it is very clear. even at normal speed. It's it's pretty clear, I think. The other thing too is, uh, even though somebody is a Freemason, uh, they're still a human being. It doesn't mean that they don't have emotions. Oh it no! It doesn't mean that they don't carry uh, a heaviness. Uh, that they don't struggle with uh, with certain things, uh, maybe things that they've been involved in or things that they know. You know, but they are sworn to secrecy because of the Brotherhood. You know, that being sworn to secrecy, that oath, yes, it overrides uh, how perhaps you would actually want to operate, but that doesn't mean inside, internally, mm -hmm. that you're not struggling with certain things. Absolutely. Well, there are, you have emotions. You know, human beings exactly. have emotions and you have, to, you have to cope with that. You know, that's that's what it, I think. What it, and I, and I, I really got that sense from him that that's what kind of what was going on, you know, above and beyond even the Masonic level i think on a, on a human level it was like he was communicating somehow yeah. you know in, in some yeah. sense so it, it was pretty interesting um so that, that's basically what happened and um you know i hope it brings a little more light to the 
to the to the subject. And, um, you know, it's not a, a huge revelation, I guess, but it's but it's something it's like another piece to the yes. puzzle, sort of, you know. Yeah. And that's what I've been telling folks, Walt, is that one aspect of this or one piece of the puzzle by itself may not mean a lot. So, you know, what we're doing is we are building a case based upon circumstantial evidence, not direct evidence, because we weren't in the band, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> we weren't playing with Billy. Yeah, we weren't there. We weren't there, but it's circumstantial. So when we take your interaction and we combine it with uh, Denny's previous interaction on that interview from a year or two ago, mm -hmm. uh, when we listen to Dana Carvey calling him Billy, uh, when right. we hear Olivia yeah. Harrison saying, hello, Billy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we start to add all of these pieces together. This in the uh, Martin Scorsese film uh, about George Harrison. You know, Bill comes into the room. George is sitting on a sofa, and George reaches up and says, "Hello, William. Mm -hmm. Good to see you I've again." Seen that, I've seen Something that, yeah. to that effect. Yeah, 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 right. So, you know, this is just not uh, an isolated case. We have many, many instances where these uh, interactions have been recorded. They have been documented. It's just a matter of us putting them all together. And then, you know, putting on a cap that says, okay, let's critically think through this. Right. And let's be uh, reasonable and use logic. What are we looking at? Right. And so, I mean, the evidence to me is overwhelming. Oh, I, I agree. I agree. Overwhelming. When you, when you really look at it, you know, if you just, yes. look, if you just take a surface viewpoint, you can say, oh, well, that's just a bunch of stuff that people put together. And, and, and like you say, when you put things in isolation, it doesn't seem as important. But when you put it all together, when you string it all together, it, it makes a trail, you know, like why would anybody call him William? I mean, it's not his middle name. It's, you know, I mean, if it wasn't his real name, why would they just randomly call him William or Beetle Bill or, or you know, whatever the reference is? It just exactly, you know, and and, you know, like my my interaction with Danny, um, he knew exactly what I was talking about. He, he knew the bill I was referring to. Yes. But it just, you know, he just kind of let it out gradually, you know. And uh, it was it was funny. Um, one one more thing before we wrap up. I, and I ran across this and you you may be aware of this. Um, there's there's a I think it's a John Grisham book uh, where he talks about um, something that that MI6 does. And I, I don't want to get too deeply into what MI6 is and stuff, but it's a it's a brand. It's an arm of the, of the Tavistock Institute. It's British Secret Service. Man. Right. I think they were. I think they were heavily involved in this this whole thing because yeah the British Tavistock, version of the CIA yeah, yeah. right exactly Tavistock I think uh, orchestrated this whole thing um, but um, they have a procedure according to Grisham anyway this is in his book I don't know the title of the book um, that's called radical appearance modification have you heard of that yes and uh, the title of McCartney's second solo album is Ram. But in, all in capital letters, like you would do, you would do that when each letter met, stood for another word. You know, um, what's that called? Uh, um, there's a term for that. I forget what it is. Uh, yeah, like an acronym. Acronym, yes. Yeah. Um, so I always thought that was kind of a curious title. I, I, like I said, I was never a huge fan of McCartney's solo work with just him or even with Wings. But um, – I don't know. I just always kind of thought that was a curious title. And, it, and it, if you think about it, there's a lot of levels to that. If, if that does indeed refer to his, you know, radical appearance modification, um, or the fact that it's Billy Shears, the shepherd and the, you know, that, that, all that whole thing. So, so maybe there's a bunch of different levels to that. I don't know. Had you ever heard of that? I have heard of that. And, uh, yeah, somebody had brought that to my attention going back, I guess, about a year ago or so. I don't discount anything. Um, yeah, yeah. In the work that I've done, you know, Billy was you know, clearly tied into Tavistock. He was clearly tied into um, British intelligence. He was uh, he participated in work with the CIA, especially during the uh, the Summer of Love at the Monterey Pop Festival and in the distribution of LSD. LSD. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, when you think about it, the Beatles were, you know, one of the main proponents of that. I mean, they exactly they, they talked about that, you know. Well, that's what Sergeant Pepper was all about. Sergeant Pepper yeah. was the introduction into the psychedelic era, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't discount that. In uh, in the memoirs of Billy Shears, he says that uh, RAM is an acronym for replacing a McCartney. Oh well, there's another one. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the MI6 acronym 
does not apply. Yes. Yes. Right. So it doesn't mean that at all. That's the thing. You know, uh, this is uh, really a case study in how the uh, the shadow government or the, the deep state, whatever you want to call it. Cabal. <laughs> the cabal. Yeah. <laughs> how it operates. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's I, I've learned so much from this, uh, Walt, to be honest. Um, when I first got into this, I didn't think it, I would be doing this two and a half years later. I, I mean, at, to the degree that I am. Yeah, and, and there's so much to it. It's a, it's very convoluted. There's so many layers. Yeah. You know, by intention, by intention. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I am so glad that uh, you contacted me, Walt. It's always wonderful to speak to you. And uh, I'm glad you gave me the time to to come on and, and talk a little bit about this. And again, oh, again, it's just you know, it's maybe one small piece, but it. You know, sometimes a small piece leads to a bigger, a key to a bigger puzzle. Yeah, yeah. And anytime you want to come on to talk about anything, just, just let me know because uh, we have great conversations. And uh, before we got um, uh, to recording this show, folks, so uh, Walt is in the process of uh, writing another book. So we will uh, cover that too, Walt, when uh, you have that finished. Do you have a, um, a timeline? Do you have a due date when you think you're going to have the book completed? Uh, I'm hoping to have it done by late spring. And okay. Then, uh, the the actual writing, and then you know you have to have it edited, and then you have to try to get an agent to represent it. So who knows? But um, I, I dedic I've dedicated myself to finishing it. Now I've been working on it for quite a while, uh, so so I'm hoping that you know working on it daily will, will get me to where I want to be more quickly. And it has uh, to do with the music industry. It does. It does. It's actually the the working title is Blues Club. There again with a club. The club element, being in the club, yes. like like Danny's yeah. in the club, and <laughs> that club <laughs> in a larger the club we're sense, not in. <laughs> in a, exactly, yeah. and, and and don't want to be <laughs> actually. So uh, I, I hope I hope that it um, sort of falls in line with the way I, I think people are, in a larger sense, I think people are waking up, you know, uh, to to exactly what you're talking about, and you know, you're you're one of the people on the forefront of that, and I think shows like. Uh, coast to coast and those kind of shows are starting to get people to a, to a higher degree of awareness and, and yeah. illumination, maybe you could say, you know, uh, we're be becoming more aware of things that are just not as they present themselves to be. And, and I hope that's happening. I, 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 it's part of why I am on this journey that I'm on to, to try and talk about this kind of stuff. And, you know. It's a good journey to be on. It's the yeah. best journey to be on because uh, this is really what it's all about, right? It, it's all about learning as much as you possibly can, learning the truth. That's the thing, right? right? And right. then applying that truth to your life and uh, also enriching your soul. Exactly. With that knowledge. Yeah. Right. That's really what it's all about. Um, but that's a, that's a, probably a discussion for another show. Well, like you said in your piece, it's ego versus soul development. That's really yes. what it comes down to. And you have to get rid of your ego and get – Moving in that direction, and and you're right. that is exactly. a nice show. But so so anyway, thanks uh, for having me on today, Mike. I, I appreciate it. it was, I think you're it was very a welcome conversation. Work. I hope people enjoy it and um, see what happens. Okay, and I'll catch up with you on Facebook. And thank you so much again for coming on. Okay, thanks, Mike. Take it easy. Bye, bye, Walt. Enjoy bye your bye weekend. Now. You too. And that concludes another Sage Quay interview. And I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the description box below. And as always, I would like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can find all my social media and web links by visiting my hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to check out my music and album releases. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone with the next show. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.